Any parent knows that colds spread like wildfire, especially through schools. New research may give a clearer picture of just how exactly infectious diseases such as the common cold, influenza, whooping cough, and SARS can spread through a closed group of people. Marcel Saladay, a faculty member in the Department of Biology at Penn State University, developed a new technique to count the number of possible disease-spreading events that occur in a typical day. Theoretically, scientists know that every day people come into contact with many other people, that interactions vary in length, and that each contact is an opportunity for a disease to spread. However, Saladay decided to figure out the number of person-to-person -person contacts systematically using a population of high school students, teachers, and staff as a model for a closed group of people. Salovey and his team designed a method to count how many times possible disease-spreading interactions occurred during a typical day. So it's important to know with how many people one interacts and for how long, because with the more people you interact and the longer you interact with them, the more likely are you going to spread a disease if you're infectious. Volunteers were asked to spend one school day wearing matchbox-sized sensor devices, called moats, on lanyards around their necks. Like a cell phone, each moat was equipped with its own unique tracking number, and each moat was programmed to send and receive radio signals at 20-second intervals to record the presence of other nearby moats. Volunteers were then asked to simply go about their day by attending classes, walking through the halls, and chatting with other people. At the end of the day, Saladay's team collected the moats and recorded how many moat-to-moat -moat interactions had occurred and how long each interaction had lasted. In Saladay's study, an interaction was not defined as just a face-to-face -face conversation. He explained that when people aren't talking, they might be sneezing and coughing in each other's direction, bumping into each other, and passing around pathogens. In our study, close proximity was defined as a maximal distance of three meters because we know from other studies that if you exhale droplets and there are virus particles in those droplets, those can only travel so far. Saladay and his team found that the total number of close proximity events was 762,868. He explained that the same two people might have had very many short interactions. However, his team counted each brief interaction individually, since each event is a new opportunity for a pathogen to jump from person to person. Saladay and his team also found that, at the end of the day, most people had experienced a fairly high number of person-to-person -person interactions, but they also found very little variation among individuals. Strikingly, they did not find individuals who had an extraordinarily high number of contacts when compared with the rest of the group. Saladay said that while schools may indeed be hotbeds for colds and the flu, individual students do not seem to vary with regard to exposure risk due to their contact patterns. Saladay also said that data from his moats confirmed an important social networking theory, that contact events are not random because many closed triangles exist within a community. A closed triangle is a situation where you have three people, person A, person B, person C. If person A interacts with person B, and person A also interacts with person C, then if person B interacts also with person C, that's a close triangle. Saladay hopes that networking data such as his may help guide public health initiatives such as vaccination strategies and prevention education. For ScienceCast, I'm Katrina Voss.